Thank you, Pierre. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Do you understand me? No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you. It's a great honor to, you know, to introduce this uh, Colbert uh, Altagama session with Cantar, Nerodi, and other people. And I will try not to duplicate what the other presenters will present because then it would not be fair for everybody. Um, the first thing I want to say about the future of luxury or the challenges of luxury is demand. In a recent book published by Altagama, in which uh, Pierre, uh, François Henri Pinault wrote a paper, I don't know if Colbert distributed that uh, paper, uh, François Henri Pinault said something very interesting that was two years ago before COVID. He said, the size of the market of luxury is three billion people. So it's not a, an obscure analyst who says that. It's the CEO of the second worldwide luxury group, part of Colbert, three billion people. And when I think of luxury, these big numbers don't come to mind. What comes to mind is small. Uh, craftsmen, uh, small ateliers, small sizes, small volumes, etc. And the reality may be three billion people. And I think that's the main challenge we have because there are numbers which pro, you know, bring us in a modernity of quantity, whereas luxury is based on quality. On the other hand, without quantity, the business model doesn't work. The, you know, you don't make much money making Bugatti cars at 500,000 euros, etc. You make much more money by selling Porsche cars at half the price of Bugatti. So in fact, the, the main challenge is how do we maintain the dream while in fact becoming something bigger than what we ever went? Where, I'm sorry. The second thing, which is a challenge, especially for us in Paris and for us in Milano, and by the way, I will be spending five days with Altagama luxury brands in one week. And the Italian people, they are our main friends and challengers. This is why sometimes we buy their companies, by the way, because they represent a treasure. The main challenge for us is to understand that the market is somewhere else. And it's somewhere else, as you know, because you know the figures, uh, we've attributes and characteristics of the market that we have a difficulty to understand. The first one is that, let's talk about Asia. In Asia, luxury is not a luxury. Le luxe n'est pas un luxe. We live from the start in a cultural, you know, bath, I would say, in, in France at least, where people say luxury is excessive, we don't need it, etc., etc. In Asia, they need luxury. We are the thermometer of people's happiness. This is a materialistic civilization where happiness is measured by what people are, certainly, but also what people have. So we look at this as if it was bizarre, but you know, success is the basis of the Chinese culture today among the young people. And how do you show success? Through French, Italian brands, for cars, German brands, etc. So we have created something we must not destroy, is the thermometer of the value of Asian people compared to themselves. That's incredible. Le luxe n'est pas un luxe. The second thing we have a difficulty to understand as managers, because most of you are managers, is the notion of there is no old money in, in emerging countries. Emerging countries which represent the growth of the sector Forget old money. And it's very difficult because we live in a part of the world where our parents or our grandparents told us, oh, this is a luxury brand of champagne. This is not. This is a luxury brand of clothing, of leather, and this is not. So we learn by heritage. And now, where is the growth? People, where there is no heritage. No, no grandfather or father told them what's the best champagne to drink. So they rely on friends. They rely on influencers and now come into the scope of the media of what we do in Asia and in other emerging countries. These people who are middle people, middle men or middle women, who tell them, oh, that's the one to buy. And they are newcomers. We didn't think 
about them. And this is why, this is why influencers, uh, marketing, influential marketing is so different in emerging countries and in Asia than it is here or in Milano or in Napoli, etc., or in New York, I should say. The, first, the third thing which is a challenge for our thinking, thinking is the idea of first buyers. Most of the buyers of luxury now are new buyers. And what is a new buyer? It's somebody who doesn't know, first. Second, he, wants, he doesn't want to be elevated. He doesn't want to be downgraded. So he says, what's the thing to buy if I want to look nice, which is called face saving? And how do you know? What, well, the answer is, what's top of mind? What's in the social media? What are the social media in China talking about? Which creates a huge pressure for our brands to be always on the top of the buzz. And this is why managing brands now internationally, especially in, in, in Asia, is becoming a huge challenge. First, it's very demanding in terms of cash, in terms of talents, in terms of understanding uh, lo local insights, this idea that we must be on the top permanently. And this is why we may say it, although we talk about small, tiny brands as the epitome of luxury, the brands we showed there, Kantar showed us, are called mega brands. In all groups, uh, the goal is to be beyond 1 billion euros. Ah, when will our brand be 1 billion euros sales and more? And uh, Vuitton, Gucci, and Chanel and Hermes are far above. And yet, they must look as if they were small, because it's part of the dream. Finally, a fourth reason why the market is growing so much and may reach, as François Ripino said, three billion people, three milliards, is the new business models. That is, all the people who invented another way to reach newcomers. Everybody is talking about second hand. Everybody is talking about rental. Everybody is talking about subscription. You don't need to buy a Ferrari. You can subscribe to a, a, to a subscription where you have the right to have, during 20 days, a luxury car, and you choose among a portfolio of cars, and, uh, and digital platforms. Digital platforms themselves make everything accessible. And that's the challenge. And uh, I want to spend some time on that last issue about the digital platforms. What you have understood for long is that luxury has moved away from scarcity. Scarcity may be true for limited editions which create, by the way, a second-hand market. But scarcity is not anymore behind 1 billion euros or more. It's impossible. So we have moved from scarcity to exclusivity. And exclusivity is this notion of only at us you have this amount of extra value. And so far, one key pillar of exclusivity was selective distribution. Selective distribution is at the basis of the success of the top brands there. Where can you buy a Rolex at Rolex? If you find a Rolex in another store than Rolex, it's a fake. Where can you buy a Vuitton at Vuitton? If you find Vuitton elsewhere, it's a fake. Now, that was in the old world. Because the question is, can we still maintain selective distribution when you see the size and the power of digital platforms? which say, oh, the world has changed. Selective distribution is an old concept, forget it. And that's also what says the luxury pavilion. And I think that also at Brussels, at the level of the European community, the notion of selective distribu distribution, which is a pillar of, of exclusivity, is always battled by people who say, why limit the distribution of luxury? Modernity is open the doors to everybody. And here, remember, selective distribution means you select your customers. There is this notion of selection in exclusivity. There is a selection of ingredients. There is a selection of process. There is a selection of distribution. And there is also a selection of clients. So I think these are the challenges. And another challenge is if we grow the business, how do we maintain the price premium? Because there is no luxury without price premium. <clears throat> but if you ask about price premium, an American brand, like Michael Kors, uh, Keith Spade, uh, and others, or Coach, they say, oh, we don't like the work price premium. 
In France, we love the, the word price premium because our luxury is made to capture a lot of this price premiumness. And the question is now not how to maintain luxury relevant, but how to make people dream still to luxury, about luxury, while being ready to give the maximum price to us. Because the French approach to luxury is top, which means it's not the best, but we want to have the best premium pricing. And premium pricing is an issue that I will uh, uh, conclude my speech about, is this is why French luxury is so obsessed about creating monopolies. Only, at, only in Champagne can we make Champagne. Uh, only us, uh, uh, of course there are people doing copies, etc. But we have the, the, the process, the historical process, etc. So you cannot base a premium pricing if you don't recreate some kind of mental, a kind of mental uh, exclusivity. And also the importance of the artist, of the creators, what you say, only at us, for 30 years, Chanel was saying, only at us you can find Lagerfeld, which was an ingredient brand commanding a premium price in an exclusive strategy. So this is, I think, the challenges, and uh, also a difference with Italy, because the Italian, and I think Altagama will tell us more, have a little different approach about this notion of price. If you look at what Armani is doing, you have Armani Privé very high, uh, price premium, and then layers of exclusivity. You have uh, uh, Armani Collection, uh, Armani Exchange, etc. So, in fact, Italian, some Italian brands have invented levels of exclusivity, whereas us in France, so far, and at the Comité Colbert, the brands say, okay, there is no layer of luxury, we have there is luxury, and our brand represents a whole. Uh, I just want to finish because I have how many seconds? It's done by something. I think one issue we will have to raise is, will luxury consumption be sustainable? It doesn't mean, are we sustainable for ecology, uh, carbon emission, etc. Is Is the fact of inducing people to buy always the best something that will last long in emerging countries? And, and not to be uh, elusive too much, in China in particular. Because when you, when you show too much your success, there is a risk that you create a social disharmony. And as you know, China is obsessed with now the notion of social harmony, that is uh, not creating too much differences between people, too much visible differences between people. So I think there is an issue for luxury as a whole of looking sustainable, not in terms of climate, but in terms of behavior. That's what I wanted to say in 12 minutes and more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.